Good afternoon. As Provost of Central European University, it is my privilege to convene this 2016-2017 academic year opening. Before anything else, I would like to address a very warm welcome to the new class of students starting their journey at CU these days. Dear incoming students, this ceremony is dedicated to you. I would also like to welcome and acknowledge our continuing students, members of the faculty and administrative staff, and a distinguished member of our board of trustees. A most cordial welcome to all of you and thank you for being with us today. Today's opening is a special one. We are gathering to welcome new members of the CU community in our new home and under the leadership of our new president and rector, Michael Ignatiev. We welcome today 100 non-degree non students, 563 new master students, and 94 PhD students coming from 110 countries of the world. Today is also a premiere as this is the very first event in the new part of our campus, in this auditorium. The finalization of these two buildings, another 13 and 15, just in time for the beginning of the academic year, marks the end of the first phase of the redevelopment of the CEU campus. We will complete the transformation of the entire campus in the coming three years. We are very proud of these two new buildings. They are world class from the point of view of architectural standards, functional efficiency and educational technology. They will make possible for the university to serve our students who represent our primary constituency in new ways and better but also Budapest and Hungary more broadly, and possibly even more remote communities and groups. Please allow me to introduce briefly another new member of the CU community. Michael Ignatiev took the helm of CU as our president and rector on 1st of August, less than two months ago. Michael is a distinguished scholar, writer, and public intellectual with an outstanding global reputation. All of us at CEU are looking forward with confidence and enthusiasm to working with Michael under his leadership at a time when the university is about to undertake new and major institutional transformation. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, our ceremony will begin with the opening remarks by the President and Rector, Michael Ignatiev. Michael, please. Uh, good afternoon, and allow me on behalf of all of you to say, wow, uh, it is a historic moment for this uh, university. This isn't my first time at CU, this may be my fourth or fifth. So I feel the history of this place coursing through my veins. Uh, this is a beautiful new building in the heart of Budapest that says, we're a global university for a global city. Uh, we want to say to our Hungarian friends, come on in, join us in this adventure in learning. Uh, we want to have the capacity to come together, to learn together, and this room expresses that wish. We're all in one room. Good things are bound to happen. Uh, one person in this room will feel the history of this moment better than anybody else. And that's uh, a distinguished uh, Oxford academic, a Canadian, all good people are Canadian, it seems to me. Uh, and uh, that's something I warn you about. My favoritism towards Canadians is shameless. Um, but Bill Newton Smith is next, perhaps to our founder, the single person most responsible for the creation of this university uh, he made pioneering and heroic contacts with dissident European, Eastern European intellectuals in the early in the 1980s, uh, worked with Mr. Soros to make it possible to create this institution, uh, this institution committed to the ideals of open society, and Bill is here, and I want us to acknowledge his heroic work that made this day possible. I 
I can't resist, as your incoming president, to uh, give you a little advice as you start uh, the adventure of learning. Um, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about one of my intellectual heroes, Michel de Montaigne. Michel de Montaigne writing in the 1560s s and 70s, a French humanist scholar, a skeptic, one of the wisest men who ever lived, who lived through a time just as terrible as this. We all think the times are terrible, but he lived through convulsive and horrible uh, civil war, religious war, the worst war of all is religious war. Uh, he saw neighbors slaughtered. He saw a great country, France, spinning out of control. He lived through dark times, in other words, uh, and produced, as many of you know, the essays, which are some of the wisest things ever written. One of the things that he, he put as a motto for everything he did was the sentence, que sais-je? What do I know? And if there's a single thing I'd like you to do as students and teachers this year, is to think hard about that question. What do I know? How do I know what I know? Why do I think I know what I know? Um, why is that an important question today? Because we have never, what is specific to this moment and to this generation, is the flood of information on every device that you've, I hope, turned off Information is flooding in to your devices, flooding onto your screens. Uh, you ha your generation has a capacity to uh, access the riches of the Library of Alexandria. You have the capacity to access knowledge with a speed that Michel de Montaigne would have thought was just inconceivable. But with that torrent of information, has come a problem that grows ever more serious as the years go by, which is how do we winnow fact from opinion? How do we winnow, distinguish, between rumor and what is true? How do we distinguish between discourses about the world and the hard reality of the world as it actually is? How, above all, Do we create a stable foundation of knowledge, knowledge, under our feet so that we can reason together as citizens, so that we can act to change the things that are so wrong with the world? You can't do anything without knowledge. And it has to be true. And it has to stand the stubborn test of reality. And if there's a single thing that this university has to teach, It is to make you to respect knowledge and know what it is and know how to distinguish it from lies, from falsehood, from rumor, from opinion. I say this, as you can tell, with some feeling because I'm a democratic citizen. I'm proud of living in a democracy. I took this job in part because I love the ideal of defending open society. But the epistemology of an open society is a careful attention to knowledge and truth. You lose that. You lose freedom very quickly. The referendum campaigns in Britain, the referendum campaigns currently underway in this country, the election in another great democracy, a country I love and that's given me shelter uh, and taught me so much. Those elections, those referendum, ask us very, very difficult questions about whether we've entered a post-truth politics. Folks, we enter a post-truth politics and we leave democracy. We leave freedom. We go into a new place that is darker and much more uncertain. So the mission of a university like this, very simple, is to make sure that every single person in this room comes out at the end of your master's degree, end of your PhD degree, knowing what you know. Knowing what you know. Having that granite of a firm attachment, a passionate attachment, to knowledge in all its difficulty, uh, because that will guide you as you make policy, it will guide you as you change the world, it will guide you to be citizens, and it will guide you to be friends. You will not learn all of this in a classroom. With all due respect to the teachers, and there's some wonderful ones in this room, 
you will learn it mostly from yourselves. That was the thing I learned at Harvard when I was doing my PhD. I learned much more from my fellow students than I ever did from those grand and fancy professors. And then when I became a grand and fancy professor, I learned to my surprise, I learned more from my students than I did from my distinguished colleagues. That's how it is. We either function as a community of learning in which we have an equality in our commitment to finding true knowledge, or it won't work. We'll break down. We mustn't stovepipe. We mustn't separate ourselves. We mustn't think all truth is contained in one discipline, in one knowledge area. The hour is late. We need all hands on deck to pay due respect to uh, knowledge. And if we come out with a university that has as its core mission teaching students to respect that deep question of Michel de Montaigne, what do I know? Que sais-je? We'll be in wonderful shape. Many of the things that you learn can't be taught in a classroom. Some of the most painful things you learn, you learn in life, you learn in conflict, you learn in sorrow, and you learn in loss. I'm here to tell you, everything that I have learned, I had to pay for in real money, in the real money of life. But the other thing I learned about learning is that I've learned most when I laughed. When I heard laughter. So, folks, as I walk the corridors this year and in the years ahead, the sound I most want to hear in this place is the sound of laughter. Because if I hear the sound of laughter, I know we're learning together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. And now, two CU students will address our gathering. First, a continuing student followed by an incoming student. So please welcome in a moment Anna Chukovic, a second year National Studies student. Anna is a recipient of the CEU Alumni Scholarship, works at the Open Society Archives, and is very active in the CEU chapter of the European Horizons think tank. Originally from what was then Yugoslavia, Anna and her family immigrated to Detroit in the late 1990s. There, she worked in the fields of immigration, community organizing, and arts and culture. This summer, she joined the City of Detroit Office of Immigrant Affairs in developing strategies for refugee resettlement and policies for immigrant integration. Her master thesis research focuses on the impact of immigrant communities on the revitalization and redevelopment of post-industrial cities. Anna, you have the floor. Good afternoon. It is a privilege and an honor to be here and share the room with you at the 26th opening ceremony at CEU. Thank you to the provost, the rector, Professor Schneider, and ASCA for your remarks, and congratulations to all of the award recipients today. Thanks to my colleagues at Nationalism Studies, to professors from my department and outside, to the Yugoslav monitoring team at the Open Society Archives and CEU staff, my experience here has truly been and continues to be transformational, both personally and academically. Throughout my first year, I took a variety of courses, some that aligned with my original research topic and some that were of deep personal interest. In the winter, among many, I looked forward to the course on transnational migration because it covered the intersection between the global and the local, and it became a space to engage in ideas and discussions that prompted me to look at the world a bit more differently than before to look at the world and its dimensions more critically, to understand the many elements that interact and create the reality as is, both in my immediate environment and on the global stage. We discussed concepts and trends that I previously thought about or observed, but could not quite find a way to frame. And at one point, the framework became clear. Things made sense. It was at this time that my personal values, convictions, and experiences converged with the academic world and afforded me to realize my research path. The courses and the professors do not only present academic challenges, but they drive you to take a critical look at yourself and the world as you see it. 
They teach you to never stop questioning the structures within which you exist, to truly think about the positions that you take, and to consciously participate in the world around you. I believe that this is what CEU is about. It is a place where students are encouraged and given an opportunity to uncover new ideas and joint projects that foster them. I hope that you take advantage of all the opportunities during your tenure to step outside of yourself and to feed your curiosity, whether by going to lectures, taking classes outside of your department, engaging in honest discussions with your colleagues, or joining the many organizations and programs. I am grateful to the faculty, my fellow colleagues, and to the staff for creating and maintaining an intellectually stimulating and inspiring environment. Thank you, welcome to CEU, and good luck. Thank you very much, Anna. Our next speaker, Aska Zia, is starting her studies at CU this academic year as an MA student in international relations. Born in Karachi, Pakistan, Aska moved to Doha, Qatar for her undergraduate education, to Edinburgh, Scotland for a semester abroad, and now to Budapest for her graduate studies. She is interested in pursuing a career in humanitarian aid work and with refugees in particular. She is currently writing a gothic fictional novel, exploring ethical and moral conflicts on her online blog, which you are all welcome to visit. Aska, please come forward. Good afternoon. When I think about CEU, I'm reminded of the word serendipity, meaning a lucky accident. Like a lot of my new classmates, my discovery of the university was purely accidental. I came across it on a website ranking universities by location in a list with hundreds of other universities. Fate had it for, that from there it followed me to my inbox, into many calendar deadline reminders, and finally here in this gathering today. While I'm very tempted to talk about my own achievements in this speech, I think I would rather talk about you, me, us. We came by bus, plane, train, or car to reach CEU, and now are linked with hundreds of others we have never directly known, excited to read across languages and cultural differences in order to understand the vast range of perspectives in and on this world. With its in rich interdisciplinary educational curriculum and research centers, dozens of student clubs, and excellent career services office, CEU is an exciting place to be at the moment. Whether you are interested in studying the refugee crisis, delineating the intersectional relationship between race, class, and feminism, or just trying to figure out who you are in a world in constant endeavor to make you into someone, anyone. As you are here now, I think a feeling that every incoming student shares with each other the moment is the need to identify with her colleagues and the stunning metropolis that is Budapest. How do you know what you're getting at IKEA when you don't read Hungarian? <laughs> What's Hungarian for, do you know the nearest Starbucks? But I think it wasn't just about us choosing CEU, but also CEU choosing us. There is a place for everyone, no matter, and especially if you were misfit before. And these past few days, I have quickly come to realize how lucky I am to take these courses, to learn to read and think with such appreciation and assistance of accomplished, critical, helping hands. While an undergraduate Muslim Pakistani student majoring in culture and politics in a Jesuit American university in the Middle East, I took a keen interest in taking classes studying marginalized and what I, what I understand as a hyper-politicized people and identifying the multitude of complexities overlooked when studies on power relations within societies, others, some, and not the rest. Why and how does this happen is a question I'm still thinking about as I begin my graduate program now. The humanities give us a chance to read across different worlds with their different languages and cultures, to understand how they work, to see that despite the differences, as Judith Butler says, in some abiding and urgent sense, we share a world. This I wish to explore more in my time at CEU. In concluding, my expectations from CEU are very high, I must admit, and I know I share that with at least some of you too. We share the desire to be challenged on existing beliefs and having the courage to grow out of them when needed to learn about the part of our history that makes us uncomfortable, but won't go away if we just close our eyes or look the other way, to, make, be, to become compassionate and critical thinkers who live and not simply exist. I hope you join, on me this, I hope you join me on this journey too. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Aska. It is now my pleasure to introduce Professor Karsten Schneider, representing the CU faculty. Karsten is currently the head of the Department of Political Science. His main research interests are regime transitions and the consolidation and quality of democracies. He is a reputed expert in comparative methodology as well, especially in set theoretic methods, and in particular in qualitative comparative analysis and its fuzzy set extension. Professor Karsten Schneider. Dear students, dear CU leadership, uh, faculty staff, and friends of CU, uh, when I was invited to welcome you all on behalf of the CU faculty, I was of course honored, but uh, I also felt a sense of pressure because I have been attending previous events and they were in a much smaller room and uh, not so many people were looking at you, uh, but mostly I felt under pressure because uh, the speeches I was listening to back then were all really interesting, funny, moving, and to the point, just like the ones we have been listening to today. So what I tried to do in preparation for this talk, I went uh, on YouTube, <laughs> and I checked the previous speeches in order to learn from them, and two things struck me. One, I seem to be the first male faculty member uh, in decades to uh, give this speech, <laughs> maybe even actually the first one ever. I mean, uh, it's about, um, thank you. The second one is that really all speeches were very good. Virtually everything I intended to say have already been said about CEU, your life at CEU, uh, about what we faculty think about uh, the new academic year. That all has been said in very eloquent terms. And there's really nothing new I can add to this. So, But then I thought, luckily, under normal circumstances, none of you has been to these events before. I mean, nobody goes twice to the opening ceremony, so I, I will repeat some of that. And I hope I'm not uh, accused of plagiarism uh, by, by some of you, but... Um, so, theme number one is, what is CEU? And uh, all of you have been members uh, of at least one other university. Again, this is true by definition, otherwise you wouldn't, wouldn't be able to sit here. And I'm sure these were good places and you have, uh, have fond memories. What I can tell you, though, is it is unlikely that they resemble anything uh, uh, what you will find here at CU. And I know you have probably read this on the internet or you have heard it now again, and it uh, remains to be true. We have a diverse student body. Our faculty and staff comes from different places. We put a lot of emphasis on critical thinking, yet constructive thinking. Uh, we have small classes. Uh, in a fantastic campus, in a fantastic city, in a also, well, let's say, a very interesting country right now. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, but what is maybe not so clear uh, is what this really means for you, these features. And I think the most important one seems to me that your time here at C will be very intensive and transformative uh, in all its senses. I think it's true that nobody leaves uh, see you the way she or he has entered. So take a good look at uh, your neighbors. You won't recognize them uh, in 10 months. Red eyes and uh, things like this. Uh, but no, what you really, I think, will be transformative is uh, you will make friends uh, for life. Uh, they come from countries that maybe right now you can't even locate on the map. And uh, you will be exposed to diverse teaching and learning styles that you weren't even aware that existed. And because our classes are very small, the class sizes, you will be in very close touch with us, the faculty and the staff. So be aware, no sleeping in the back row and uh, no checking on Facebook during the seminars. Also because I hear we can actually beam now your content off the screen onto the classroom screen. So I, uh, that opens a whole new world. So put in broader terms, what you will learn here at CU is really not only what we faculty want you to uh, t uh, teach during our seminars, so, so to speak, the disciplinary knowledge. I think at least equally important and arguably probably more consequential for the rest of your life is really the experience or the experiences that you will make outside the classroom. Uh, so what I feel makes you a special place is how students use their time here, really, and how they so much develop into mature, curious, open-minded and good-spirited individuals. Another theme uh, at these speeches um, is usually that we share our feelings um, uh, about this new beginning of a new academic year because it seems obvious that yes, you are uh, excited, curious, and maybe even a, bit, a little bit nervous and you feel anxiety. 
But I can also share with you that we are excited <coughs> too. And you know, some of us start new courses, how will it work out? But even if you teach a course that you have been teaching before, you don't know as a, a teacher, who are you? I mean, how will you react? What, which of the two types of students will you be? Will you be only after good grades and act strategically towards this goal, like you carrying my bag and, and things like this? Or, <laughs> or will you be genuinely interested in what we have to say about our subject study and beyond? So, and I personally wish that you're of the latter sort. Uh, for reasons that I would like to briefly explain, uh, and it's kind of a selfish reason, I have to confess. And I'm speaking, I know, uh, on behalf of many, if not all, faculty members. So it goes a little bit like this. <clears throat> so I enjoy my job quite a lot, so much so that I sometimes wonder, uh, I'm surprised that I'm even paid for this. And uh, <laughs> of course not enough, uh, I should say. <laughs> uh, <that's also laughs> uh, and. And I try to diagnose, and it's, uh, I think it's the Protestant ethic syndrome. And it, it goes like this. So you are told, according to the Protestant ethic, that you can only enjoy your, enjoy your day after some hard work. And of course, there's a problem. If you already enjoy your hard work, then, then what are you supposed to do? Uh, and according to Max Weber, German sociologist and intellectual, you try to, try to please the imagined ultimate judge. So I try to justify my work by convincing myself that I'm doing something that is not only my own pleasure, but something I do something good for the community. And then you start wondering, what is it that we produce, we as faculty produce in quotation marks? And uh, the first thing that might come to mind is publications, right? Books, articles. Well, then you use these new software tools and you figure out, well, uh, you are referenced, and that's already maybe high numbers, 100 maybe 1,000, 2,000 time, times, and you compare this to some random YouTube video or tweet uh, <laughs> by people who arguably have put much less thoughts into their public statements than you for your pi final paper for any random uh, course. But, so it can't be really about the written stuff only. So what is it then that my, satisfies my Protestant ethic? And I asked precisely this question, maybe in slightly different terms, at uh, the last academic year closing at our department, and I thought it was a rhetorical question. But then a student uh, jumped up and she said, well, you produce us, your students. And, and I think it's true. Uh, it is one of the biggest satisfactions for us faculty uh, to see young students transit into a new period of uh, their life, and to also follow them once they have long left CU. It fills us as faculty really with pride to see if somebody takes up a job, an important job in government, to fight corruption. Or when they have successful careers in universities that are almost as good as CU, say Harvard or Columbia, <laughs> and when they simply turn out to be incredibly decent human beings, uh, and if they then remember you fond, uh, with fondness. So these encounters convince me that what we are about to start here and today together with you at CEU is not just simply, oh, we know stuff and we need to get it into your brain, nor is it you thinking, well, they need to give us good grades so we can earn more money soon. It is much more. It is a transformative experience, a life changer, and that's important. It is both for you and for us. So in conclusion, <clears throat> I would like to share with you what one of my old PhD supervisors once said to me. He said that what he likes most about our profession, so and it's not a job, it's a profession, again, Max Weber, uh, is that one is constantly exposed to young people full of energy, dreams, and ideas, and sometimes, admittedly, unsettling ideas, and we think sometimes wrong ideas, uh, but ideas nevertheless. So one can simply not afford to get mentally old in our profession. And I would say that in this spirit, here is my request on behalf of all CU faculty to you students, please keep bringing on your ideas uh, because this will keep us forever young. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Karsten. Speaking of universities, CEU is a mission-driven university, and our Open Society mission is a special one. It informs our particular institutional choices, helps to define the profile of the university, and also to distinguish CEU from other higher education institutions. CEU is in more than one way different from most other universities, and we programmatically cultivate these differences. The main tools for pursuing our mission, however, 
are not fundamentally different from those of other universities. They are teaching and learning and research. As a means to emphasize the importance of research at CEU and by way of recognizing the research achievements of our faculty, two years ago the University Senate decided to create the CEU Award for Outstanding Research. It is now with very much pleasure that I would like to announce the two recipients of the 2016 CEU Award for Outstanding Research. They are Gergely Hartsosh from the Department of Mathematics and its Applications and Karsten Wilke from the Department of History. Professor Hartsosh cannot be here with us today to receive the award because he is on his way back to Budapest uh, right now from a conference. But let me say a few words about him and also uh, about the justification from the award. He received his PhD degree in mathematics from Princeton University. After three years at the University of Texas at Austin, he returned to Hungary in 2006 and became a member of the prestigious Alfred Rennie Institute of Mathematics of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. He joined the CU Department of Mathematics and its applications in 2007. Professor Hartzos was nominated for the CEU Award for Outstanding Research for a remarkable co-author paper published last year in the Duke Mathematical Journal, one of the most prestigious journal of, journals of mathematics in the world. The paper solves a fundamental problem of hyperbolic manifolds whose roots are in quantum mechanics and number theory. And I'm quite sure we all know what is that. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Hartzos cannot be here today, as I mentioned. The second recipient of the award is Karsten Wilke. Karsten is a faculty member of the History Department at CEU since 2009 and presently also director of the Center for Religious Studies of the university. He graduated with a PhD in Jewish studies from the University of Cologne. His research focuses on the history of Jews within the social and intellectual environments of medieval and modern Europe. Professor Wilke is one of the most productive faculty members at CEU. His work has been published by prestigious publishers in several languages. His multidisciplinary and wide-ranging work has secured him a worldwide recognition as a leading scholar in the field of Jewish studies. Among his most recent publications, the Marrakesh Dialogues reveals a previously unknown Jewish pole polemical work from the Spanish Renaissance. His new book, Farewell to Shulamit, published in 2016, reads the biblical song of Solomon as a fresco of the multi-ethnic society in the borderlands of the Hellenic Palestine. I would like to ask Professor Wilke to come forward to receive the award from President and Rector Michael Ignatius. Now let's move to teaching. For the second time in the history of the university, also following a decision of the Senate, we will present a distinguished teaching award to CU faculty members. This year, there are three recipients. We are pleased to confer the award on Professor Lajos Bokros from the Department of Economics and the School of Public Policy. Lajos is a former Chief Operating Officer of the University. He served as a Minister of Finance of Hungary and was a member of the European Parliament. The, faculty, the members of the Faculty Selection Committee for the award were particularly impressed by Professor, Professor Bokros' attention to individual student learning. His student testimony stressed how rigorously and generously he fosters their learning while systematically consider real life situation and practical applications and promoting active participation in all his classes. Professor Bokros is not in Budapest this way as he is lecturing at Babes Boy University in Cluj, Romania. The second recipient of the teaching award is Cristina Cordunanu Huci. Cristina is an assistant professor at the School of Public Policy. She holds a PhD in political science from Duke University and her research and teaching focus on international development, governance, and policy making in non-democratic societies. In the nomination material, Christina's students praised her innovative assignments, constant feedback, and the active support she provides to them. The selection committee for the award was also impressed by her thoughtful reflections about her teaching and student learning. 
Professor Cordonano, please come forward to receive the award. We are also pleased to confer the 2016 CEU Distinguished Teaching Award on Associate Professor Maciej Kisilowski from the CEU Business School. With two doctorates and four master degrees in three different disciplines from Yale, Princeton, INSEAD, and his hometown, uh, Warsaw, Maciej may seem to be a professional collector of graduate degrees. <laughs> But this makes sense considering his interdisciplinary interest and also ambitions. His work focuses on training managers to interact with often unpredictable governments and on applying modern tools of strategic management to improve public and non-for-profit institutions. The selection committee was particularly impressed by Professor Kishilovsky's excellent syllabi, research-based teaching strategy, and effective use of educational technology. Professor Kishilovsky, please come forward to receive the award. <laughs> Congratulations. I will shortly call upon President Ignatiev to present the European Award for Excellence in Teaching in the Social Sciences and Humanities, which is the last award of the day. Before that, please allow me to say a few words about the history and the meaning of the award. This is yet another illustration for what CEU stands for. Europe has witnessed unprecedented developments in higher education in the last 15, 16 years. The face of higher education in all countries of the continent has changed dramatically during this time, largely due to the emergence of a transnational European space for dialogue and also for practice in higher education, and also of a European-wide policy framework for higher education. CEU has welcomed many of these developments, and it has been at the forefront of promoting many of them. At the same time, as a university committed to critical thinking and responsible social engagement, we have noted major shortcomings of this European effort, such as an overemphasis on new organizational structures and forms at the expense of content and substance in higher education, a tendency to neglect the social sciences and humanities, or a surprising and sustained disregard for the value of teaching and learning as opposed to research. The European Union, for example, launched in 2000 an ambitious project to build a European research area, aptly supported until today with hundreds of billions of euro, new European institutions and policies, and valuable awards promoting and recognizing research achievements. At the same time, at least until recently, there has been no attention to teaching and learning at European level, as if only the production of knowledge through research mattered, but not the transmission and dissemination of knowledge through teaching and learning. Can a small university like CEU even hope to do anything to address this situation? Can we counter powerful continental-wide trends? A few years ago, we decided we could. One of our contributions was the creation of a European Award for Excellence in Teaching in the Social Sciences and Humanities. As the person who had the idea of the award initially, I am both pleased and humbled to see that this initiative, embraced by many, many colleagues at CEU and outside CEU, has indeed contributed to a European-wide discussion, not without occasional controversy, about the value of teaching and learning in general and in the social sciences and humanities in particular. The European Teaching Award for Excellence in Teaching in the Social Sciences and humanities is an expression of CEU's aspiration to be a new model of higher education, engage in innovative and effective ways with the world around us beyond the walls of our own campus. At the same time, it is also now an, an expression of our conviction that the main raison d'etre of universities is their students and their students' learning, and that teaching and learning, including in the social sciences and humanities, must remain at the core of the work of higher education institutions. 
There is no better time for us to express this commitment than when welcoming our incoming students, and for this reason, no better moment to present the European Teaching Award. We are very grateful to have been able to benefit from the generosity of a donor who has endowed the award, making possible to present it every year to an outstanding teacher and scholar. I would now like to call upon President and Rector Michael Ignatiev to present the award to this year's recipient. Uh, this is my first uh, ceremony, and these awards for teaching are, you're not just spectators. What's happening here is we're making a commitment. The university is making a commitment to you as students that teaching matters to us, and we want to recognize it across Europe, and we want to recognize it among our, uh, among our great teachers. So uh, we're on the hook here. That's, that's what these ceremonies are saying. Um, and it's an, a special pleasure to uh, read out the laudatio for Jim Murdoch. Uh, Jim is the professor of public law, school of law at the University of Glasgow. Uh, he's the recipient of this fifth annual European Award for Excellence in Teaching in the Social Science and Humanities. The award was initiated by, by uh, Liviu Mate, the Central European University's provost, and is overseen by the university's Center for Teaching and Learning. Now, let me talk a little bit about Jim. Over the past 24 years, Jim has developed his European Human Rights Project, EHRP, which is unique in Europe. The project is a group-based and peer-assessed course which replicates the experience of bringing a case to the European Court of Human Rights or of defending a case as the respondent government. It involves two teams of five students who are responsible for researching, preparing, and presenting written and oral submissions. Students first present to a chamber of three Supreme Court justices in London, and then the Grand Chamber in Strasbourg. And apparently, Jim says, the judges absolutely love this experience. So the judges learn and the students learn. Um, uh, EHRP, this program, is only one of a handful of innovative programs that uh, Jim Murdoch has instituted at the University of Glasgow. Keen to promote opportunities for his students to gain experience in other legal systems, he's established study abroad and exchange opportunities for them to conduct comparative research, allowing them not only to familiarize themselves with other legal cultures, but also with other languages and legal terminology. In 2012, Jim was awarded the Pro Merito Medal of the Council of Europe, uh, which is a very great distinction. And now we're just about to give him another one, the fifth annual European Award for Excellence in Teaching in the Social Sciences and Humanities. Let's give Jim Murdoch a big hand. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much. As you hear, I'm from Glasgow, and I am attempting to speak English. <laughs> it's a, a privilege and a pleasure to be here. I, I am honored. Uh, my university is honored. Um, CEU's goal, and we've been hearing a little bit about it, is to contribute to that open society that is so important in Europe today. An open society through free minds, and we've heard a lot about free minds. And this award is recognition of the importance of teaching and the importance of those uh, academics who maybe put teaching further ahead in the grand scheme of things than research in opening up society and freeing minds. Now, my university, I have to confess, is just a little bit older than, than your university. <laughs> And I had to say that. Um, 250 years ago, my predecessors in the School of Law were opening society and freeing minds. Teachers such as John Miller and one you may have heard of, Adam Smith. I'm not claiming to be doing anything as, as great and as grand as Miller or Smith, but thank you very much for recognizing that at University of Glasgow, we are still trying to open 
society and free up minds, albeit in my case in a much more uh, modest way. Today, though, of course, the wealth of nations is the quality of young people, the quality of you, the leaders of the future, students in higher education, and those of us who are teachers, fortunate enough to be teachers, work with students who constantly give us inspiration, enthusiasm, and optimism. Three days ago, it was Freshers' Week in Glasgow, the kickoff, three days ago, and I was chatting to the clerk of Senate and he said that students are getting younger every year. I put him right and I said, no, 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 they're staying the same age, we are getting older. <laughs> Whatever the case is, as we've heard, uh, you're keeping us young at heart. I have a number of, of thanks. First of all, thanks to CEU, of course, to the provost whose wonderful idea this was, to the donors, to Sally and Tunda and the team for um, possibly being slightly more patient at my inability to answer emails, uh, to the Glasgow support team who are here in the front row, uh, to Lorna, to Maria and to Rosa, each of whom has assisted, helped, supported, encouraged and basically directed me in different ways at different times. Thank you very much. And there was no holding them back from coming out here. Indeed, I think Rosa had her tickets bought within about two minutes of her uh, being advised that uh, her recommendation, her support for this award nomination had been successful. I also have to thank the students at Glasgow University, past students and even at my advanced age, future students, although not maybe as many, for their courage, um, for risk taking, for their full hardiness at signing up to some of these projects you've heard about. Um, I calculated I'd spent seven months of my life in a University of Glasgow minibus, <laughs> and that, that uh, was ever so slightly challenging. But each year, students ask me the question, uh, do you never get bored? And each year I say the same, no, no, no. Each year is entirely different. It's a brand new group of students, and it's their first year. And to those of us uh, privileged enough to work with them, it's also very much a new year for us. So the students of present and future in Glasgow, but what about the students, sorry, the present here today, you? Many of you may be asking a question, what on earth are you going to do after graduation, after you leave CEU? I hope some of you at least are considering a career as an academic teacher. If you are, despite the problems over the pay, which, which I agree is, is an issue across the world, I would suggest that you be inspired, pick up that torch, Keep trying to open society through freeing the minds of future generations. It's the best job in the world. Thank you very much, and again, thanks to CEU for, for this recognition on behalf of the University of Glasgow. Thank you. And thank you very much, Jim. That was it for today. We now conclude the opening ceremony for CEU's 26th academic year opening. On behalf of the university leadership and the faculty, I wish you all an enjoyable and successful academic year. And I would like to extend the warm invitation to all students, faculty, administrative staff members and guests to join us at the reception in the lobby of the another 13 building. Thank you.